Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Stuart here from Spain Speaks with an update on the current situation here in Spain and Spain's diplomatic stoush with Morocco seems to have come to an end, but the question is for how long? But more about that in just a moment. Firstly, a big thanks to all of the people that left comments on the last video. Lots of comments, lots of debate happening there as usual. Thanks to people that supported the channel by buying merchandise and a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon for your continuing support and helping me make these videos. Now, Let's get into the news, and as I said, that mini conflict that Spain had with Morocco earlier in the week seems to be under control as Morocco has again closed their border. As we can see here, Morocco closes the border with Spain and interrupts the migratory exodus to Ceuta. Morocco has buried the migration hatchet, at least for now. After 48 hours of chaos, Ceuta dawned calm on Wednesday after the Moroccan authorities reactivated surveillance of the Tarajal border crossing. Barely a handful of curious onlookers now approach the viewpoints of Benzu or wandered along the National Road, where two days earlier surreal scenes were witnessed with more than 8,000 undocumented migrants, elderly children, entire families crossing the border into Spain. So Morocco again closing the border and as we saw there, burying that migration hatchet. And the situation between the two countries appears to have returned to normal. But the question is, for how long? As we can see from this headline from El Mundo, Spain halts the chaos in Ceuta and expects a long struggle from Morocco. The government yesterday took a breath of fresh air in the crisis with Morocco that has caused thousands of people to illegally cross the border into Ceuta. With their breath held since Monday, the fact that the Moroccan police closed or at least were more active at the border access points prevented a massive influx of migrants. However, it is a small relief. The government assumes that the diplomatic crisis with the Alawi Kingdom is far from over. So the government here in Spain not overly optimistic that this problem has disappeared. And as we have seen over the years, every time Morocco decides to open their borders, Spain receives a huge influx of migrants and doesn't really know what to do. This particular conflict was apparently caused because Spain gave hospital access to a separatist leader who caught COVID-19 and needed medical assistance. But one gets the impression that this problem is going to go on and on and on. So things relatively calm at the moment, but we'll wait and see what Morocco's next move is. Now, as I mentioned in yesterday's video, the Spanish government has finally come to a decision on what to do with people that have been vaccinated with one dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Lots of people here in Spain, not sure of the exact amount, but I think it was around a million people received that first dose of AstraZeneca. Health workers, police, teachers received that first dose over three months ago, and they have been waiting ever since for the government to take a decision. And as we can see from this headline, that group of people, the under 60s, will have the choice between the second dose from Pfizer or AstraZeneca. The Ministry of Health and the autonomous communities have agreed on Wednesday to allow those under 60 years of age vaccinated with the first dose of AstraZeneca to choose whether to complete their vaccinations with the same preparation or with a Pfizer dose. This will require the signing of an informed consent form, according to the Minister of Health, Catalina Darias, at the end of the Interterritorial Council of the National Health System after the Public Health Commission opted on Tuesday night to complete the vaccination schedule with Pfizer. The change criteria which has been requested by several autonomous communities is due to exceptional and extraordinary circumstances and the bioethics committee will be consulted this week. The body will draw up a report on the matter. So the government finally coming to a decision on what to do with that second dose and now they're giving people the choice. And I must say that it did take them a long time to come to this decision. What were they doing? And as we can see from this headline from El País, does it even make sense to allow people to choose their vaccine? What have other countries done and why are some experts opposed to it? The experts consulted fear that this will increase confusion among citizens and even lead to a certain degree of discrimination. These decisions are unnecessarily muddying the waters. The reality is that vaccines are a scarce commodity and we cannot select a la carte, but we must do so with a public health logic. It cannot be analysed as an individual decision, protests Daniel López Acuña, former director of emergencies at the World Health Organization. So according to that expert, the government's decision creates confusion and muddies the waters, but let's be honest, that's nothing new. Now some good news yesterday for people that were planning to travel to Europe this year from outside the European Union, and it is that the EU has agreed to open its borders to vaccinated foreigners. The EU27 agreed Wednesday to reopen their external border to tourists vaccinated against the coronavirus in third countries. These must have been inoculated with vaccines
vaccines approved by the European Medicines Agency, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca or Janssen, as is the case in the United States and the United Kingdom. The conditions for vaccinated travellers to enter the EU are that they must have received the full vaccination schedule, two doses for most vaccines on the market, at least 14 days before their trip, the European Commission announced after it was approved by member states at a meeting. So there we go, EU borders to be open to people that have completed their vaccinations. Now Spain's neighbour to the north, France, is also trying to attract tourists this year and they announced yesterday that they are going to offer free PCR tests to people that visit that country. As we can see from this headline, France to offer free PCR tests to tourists and visitors this summer. France is one of the only countries to offer free PCR tests, which can cost up to 120 euros in Spain, 100 pounds in the UK and 300 euros in Sweden to residents for all purposes, including travel. But now that is being extended to tourists who visit the country over the summer. The French government hopes the free testing will make the country an attractive tourist destination and will also allow it to welcome back tourists while staying safe. Announcing the new policy, France's Europe minister told radio station Europe One, we need and we want to continue to be the first tourist destination in Europe and the world in safe conditions. So France going to offer free PCR tests for people visiting that country this year. What about Spain? Is Spain going to do something similar? Well, the answer is no, because tourism minister Reyes Moreno believes that it is difficult for Spain to be able to assume the cost of free PCRs as requested by Brussels. The European Parliament wants these tests, which detect the coronavirus and are, in many countries, compulsory for travel, to be free of charge for tourists who wish to travel within the European Union and for the COVID certificate to exempt them from quarantine. The aim of this measure is to avoid discrimination among tourists who will be able to travel because they have received the COVID-19 vaccine free of charge. Minister Morato explains that Spain expects to receive 45 million international tourists this year, which means extra spending if the PCR is free. She says that at the moment there are other priorities such as maintaining the safety net, for example, the extension of the furlough schemes until the 30th of September is being discussed. So fairly clear why Spain can't be like France and offer free PCR tests to people visiting the country this year because they haven't got the cash and they've got other priorities like the furlough schemes. Now let's have a look at a summary of the health situation in Spain. We can see the accumulated incidence rate in the last 14 days countrywide is now down to 144. There are currently 6,267 people hospitalized with COVID around the country and there are 1,740 COVID patients in ICUs and there were 66 COVID related deaths recorded yesterday which was down 17% on previous data. And when it comes to the vaccination campaign, we can see that 15.74% of the population have completed their vaccinations and 33.17% have received at least one dose, or in other words, some 15.7 million people. Now, we all know that the race has begun to attract foreign tourists this year. Spain, Portugal, Greece, Turkey, Italy, all competing for those tourist dollars. And there's a lot of interest here in Spain to attract people from the two most important tourist markets markets for Spain, the United Kingdom and Germany. The tourism minister announced the other day that she's working on travel corridors from the UK to places like the Balearic Islands and the Canary Islands, but other countries, namely Portugal and Greece, are ahead of Spain in this race. As we can see here, Spain behind Portugal and Greece in hunting British tourists. The recovery of tourism is in jeopardy due to Spain's disadvantage in attracting tourists, especially the British public, compared to its competitors. The lack of a clear strategy for attracting tourists and the restrictions imposed by the UK are discouraging bookings from both the UK and the rest of the world. On the other hand, other countries such as Portugal and Greece are managing to attract tourists for the summer and threaten to steal a large part of the demand from our country. So those dirty, rotten Portuguese and Greek scoundrels threatening to steal our tourists. But as we saw in that text, Spain is lacking a clear strategy. That's probably the reason why people are choosing to go to other countries. Now let's have a look at some of the comments from previous videos. One here from Katie, don't you have a choice in what vaccine you get? In the earlier stages of vaccine distribution, you took whatever was offered, but at this stage in the game, you are free to schedule your vaccine of choice. 17 and under can only get Pfizer, but adults here in the US can choose. Yeah, Katie, thanks for the comment. And the simple answer to that question is no, we cannot choose which vaccine we get. As we just saw before, people that had that first dose of AstraZeneca can now choose between Pfizer or AstraZeneca. But if they choose AstraZeneca, they have to fill in a form to give their consent in case something goes wrong. But the rest of the population can't choose, or at least 
that is what I believe. Here in Madrid, for example, if you go to the health department website, you'll see all of the information and it tells you all of the different age groups that are being vaccinated and with which vaccines. For example, the 50 to 59s, which is my age group, it says that we are going to be vaccinated with either Pfizer or Moderna. But I imagine that when I go to get my vaccination, I'm not going to be able to choose between the two. It's either going to be one or the other. And I think that's the case around the country, but I stand to be corrected. And I think one of the main differences is that your vaccination program program there in the United States compared to the one here in Europe is a lot more advanced. And I also imagine that vaccines there aren't as controlled as they are here because I've seen on the news that people in some states can buy vaccines at the supermarket and here that is impossible. But that's the difference between the European Union and the United States. One here from Catherine. We've stayed in the Chinchon Parador. Stunning, great food, wonderful pool, not far from the airport. Yeah, Catherine, thanks for the comment. I did mention the Chinchon Parador yesterday as a place to stay if you are in Chinchon or a place to visit. You don't have to stay there as the Parador's can be quite expensive. And I think just across from the Parador, there is also a nice hotel. But Chinchon is a place that I would recommend visiting if you are in the Madrid community or on your way somewhere passing through Madrid, check it out. You could also check out Aranjuez as well. They're quite close to each other, so you could kill two birds with one stone. Probably better to avoid a place like Chinchon in the peak months of summer because it can get very, very hot in that part of the world. So probably best to visit in spring, autumn, when the weather is not too hot. One here from Ike. Hi, Stuart. Thank you for your updates. Do you have a video on inflation during this pandemic? Food prices, apartment rent, electricity, gas and diesel, phone, propane, vehicles, health care, dining out, bank fees, etc. What prices went up or down since the pandemic? Yike, thanks for the comment, but unfortunately I don't have a video done on the topic that you mentioned there, inflation during the pandemic. I'm not really an expert on this topic, but thanks for the suggestion, and it could be a good topic to talk about with Johnny on those videos that I put out every Saturday when we have a bit of a chat about what's going on here in Spain, especially when it comes to the economy. I'll run the idea past Johnny and see what he says, because he normally has his head around this type of topic. And I'll also open the question up to the community living here in Spain or in other countries here in Europe. What prices have gone up or down since the pandemic began? If you've noticed anything, let us know in the comment section. One here from Hemi, one litre engine car with a sport mode. This made my day, LMAOL. Does it also have a sale for when driving with the wind behind? Yeah, Hemi, thanks for the comment and glad to see that you found my comment yesterday about one litre cars amusing. I mentioned yesterday that the car I was driving only had a one litre engine, but it had a sport mode in case you need to get up hills to get a little bit of extra power. And I can see from your thumbnail there that you're obviously a five litre enthusiast. But here in Spain, it's not very common for people to drive cars with big engines unless they're driving those big BMWs, big Mercedes that do have five litre engines. But for the rest of us, one litre will suffice. And for what I use the car for, it's all I need. One here from DF, the huge beer consumption in Spain is mostly done by the tourists there, I assume. I feel that many men from the UK, Germany, Scandinavia and Holland, etc., love to order beer in Spain. Yeah, DF, thanks for the comment. And I'm sure that those beer guzzling tourists from the countries that you mentioned there do add to the alcohol consumption number numbers here in Spain, but Spanish people also do love a glass of cold beer, but it has to be cold. There's definitely a beer culture here. They call it a cañas culture where you go out at night, have something to eat and wash it down with a few small glasses of beer. That's what a lot of people do. That's what they like to drink. And then afterwards they move on to something else, maybe a glass of wine, maybe a rum and coke, maybe a G&T. But Spanish people definitely do like their beers, believe it or not. And finally, one here from Tiri Tiri T. Some good news about the Costa Blanca. The province of Alicante is the first in Spain to enter the new normal by dropping the virus rate from 25. Yeah, thanks for the comment and thanks for pointing out that Alicante is again going into that new normal situation. I remember last year we also went into the new normal, but but it didn't last long. We soon went back to the old normal, if that makes sense. But as you mentioned there again, we have the new normal in Alicante because the incidence rate down there is currently very, very low. 25, as you mentioned. And the Valencian community did a very good job of getting the virus under control here in Spain. I think it's the example to follow. Other places around the country haven't been so successful, for example, Madrid and some of the areas in the north of the country. But the Valencian community, I think Galicia as well, and Murcia too, have also managed to get the health situation relatively under control. On that note, I'll start to wrap the video up. Questions and comments, please leave them in the section below. Debate the situation out as you normally do. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it, thumbs down if you didn't. I'll see you in the next one. Hasta luego.